Now for chapter five, the final chapter. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rest of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Now this is quite the terrifying verse. How many people do we see that are just worried about worldly gains, these temporary things? Albert Barnes commented, the day of judgment, the last days, the closing scenes of this world, he's mainly alluding to. You have been heaping up treasure, but it will be a treasure of a different kind from what you have supposed. Just as Paul the Apostle speaks of treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God in Romans 2. Verse 4, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. Speaking of all those in general in whom abuse their power and even abuse their workers under them, ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. To which we can see in that much more of an allusion to that of the politicians, the rulers. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, those in whom keep vineyards and such. This imagery is used throughout the Bible, the husbandman. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And that's the testimony of these apostles throughout the New Testament writings about how the last days are near, are near. That was 2,000 years ago that they wrote that. How much closer are we now? Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Charles Ellicott noted at this point, one of the mocking questions put to St. James by his enemies as they hurried him to death was, which is the door of Jesus? Because Jesus, he even says, even in Revelation it's recorded, behold, I stand at the door and knock. So they said, well, where's the door? mocking him. And failing to receive an answer to their mind, they said, Let us stone this James the just, which they did after they had cast him over the temple wall. Verse 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord, for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, how he treated Job after all of his trials and tribulations, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. In other words, let your discourse be confirmed with a bare affirmation or denial, and use no higher asservations in common discourse saying, no, I promise I'll be here tomorrow at such and such a time. I swear upon whatever, my mama's name or any of that. Don't do that. That's bad. Verse 13, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now the Catholics have taken that verse to confess your sins one unto another, and they've turned it into this confessional means. This passage is one on which Roman Catholics rely to demonstrate the propriety of confession or confession made to a priest with a view to an absolution of sin. The doctrine which is held on that point, that it is a duty to confess to a priest at certain seasons all our sins, secret and open, of which we have been guilty. This goes for all our improper thoughts, desires, words, and actions, and that the priest has power to declare on such confession that the sins are forgiven. 
but never was any text less pertinent to prove a doctrine than this passage to demonstrate that because, well, for a myriad of reasons, this is not what that verse is telling us to do. And this is just like the Catholics. They distort verse after verse after verse. The confession here enjoined is not to be made by a person in health that he may obtain salvation, but by a sick person that he may be healed. Keep it in context. Number two, as mutual confession is here enjoined, a priest would be as much bound to confess to the people as to as the people to the priest. He's just as much a sinner as anyone. Why isn't he confessing? Number three, no mention is made of a priest at all, or even a minister of religion, as the one to whom the confession is to be made. Number four, the confession referred to is for faults with reference to one another. That is, where one has injured another, and nothing is said but confessing faults to those whom we have not injured at all. You go to the person in whom you have insulted, not to some guy in a robe. And do also notice this very significant point to be made at the second clause of this verse. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now that's speaking of one in whom walks in the Spirit consistently. Many wonder why their prayers aren't answered in the way that they would give their petition up to God with, well, are you walking in the Spirit? Are you sacrificing for God? Are you putting away those fleshly urges? If you're not doing anything for God, why should he do anything for you? Verse 17, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, meaning a normal man like you and I, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months, because he walked with the Lord, such a great thing occurred. Verse 18, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. And just for clarification, all the scholars, commentators agree on this. Whenever it says, and it rained not on the earth, that's not meaning universally, but rather on the land of the ten tribes, that of the northern kingdom of Israel, where Elijah was located, and Ahab, and Jezebel, and all of that was going down for three years and six months. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. And that is the closing verse of this book of James. Now for some closing comments, and we'll tell about what happened fully at the end of James' life. Adam Clark noted, As one immortal soul is of more worth than all the material creation of God, Every man who knows the worth of his own should labor for the salvation of others. He who lays out his accounts to do good to the souls of men will ever have the blessing of God in his own. Besides, God will not suffer him or allow him to labor in vain or spend his strength for naught. And if he should never see it in his life, he may take for granted that whatsoever he has done for God in simplicity and godly sincerity has been less or more effectual. So now I'm going to read from ChristianHistory.org about the end of James' life, how he was martyred, not, not in the Bible, but according to ancient historians. After a while, James' influence became so strong that even some of the rulers believed, which horrified the scribes and Pharisees. They became afraid that soon the people would be flocking to Jesus as the Christ. Somehow, perhaps because of his strict observance of the law, the Pharisees thought they could get James to discourage the people from believing. They thereby asked him to stand at the pinnacle of the temple on Passover and speak. Apparently, James agreed. They brought him to the top of the temple, and they shouted to him from below, O righteous one, in whom we are able to place great confidence, the people are led astray after Jesus, the crucified one. So declare to us, what is this way, Jesus? Obviously, this wasn't a very wise thing for them to do. James was ready to take full advantage of such a wonderful opportunity as this, to have this huge crowd before him. On Passover now, this would have been an enormous crowd. His words are memorable. Why do you ask me about Jesus, the Son of Man? He sits in heaven at the right hand of the great power, and he will soon come on the clouds of heaven. Upon hearing this, the Pharisees were horrified, but the people were not. They began shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! which was a name that they attributed to Christ. The Pharisees, realizing the awful mistake they'd made, began crying out, Oh, oh, the righteous one is also in error. 
So the Pharisees are trying to discourage the people. No, he's wrong. Don't listen to him. You can probably guess that this had little effect on the crowd. So the next obvious thing to do was to push him down from the temple, letting the people know exactly what happens to those who dare to believe in Jesus. They climbed the temple as the people shouted, reached the top, and threw James from the pinnacle of the temple. It didn't kill him. He rose to his knees and began to pray for them, as he was so known for being a man of prayer. I beg of you, Lord God, our Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. This would not do. The Pharisees on the ground began to stone him as he prayed, while those from the roof rushed down to join the execution. One of the priests, however, a son of the Rechabites, mentioned by Jeremiah the prophet in chapter 35 of the book of Jeremiah, shouted, Stop! What are you doing? The righteous one is praying for you. But it would prove too late. A fuller, or launderer, took out one of the clubs that he used to beat clothes and smashed James on the head, killing him with one blow. And with that, we believe, just a few years before Paul the Apostle was martyred, was James the Just, the half-brother of Jesus on the earth. He was also martyred in 62 A.D.